Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our theme is Knowing the Father. And in this series, we're looking how that God, who is three in one, reveals himself to us, first of all, as being Father. He is the eternal Father, the one who has always existed. And of course, that means if God is the eternal Father, he must have an eternal Son. It's not as if God the Father became a Father at some point in human history. No, the Bible reveals in this mystery of Trinity that God is both three and one. And how do we come to know this? When God reveals himself to us as Father, we know him as Father. When God reveals himself to us as Son, we know him as Son. And we do this in the knowledge of God the Holy Spirit. This teaching requires real revelation. It can't come as a result of our own human understanding. If we were inventing the Bible and making it up, we would probably make this much more simple because we would be limited by our own human understanding. I'm so glad we don't have to depend on our human understanding. We depend on the revelation of God as revealed in the scriptures. That's why this whole program and the series of programs is called the Sword of the Spirit, because we are looking at the revelation of the Spirit that comes to us through the Word of God, which is like a sword that divides human understanding from spiritual understanding. The Bible says that spiritual truth can only be spiritually discerned. And my prayer for you, as you are watching and listening to these programs, is that God will give you a spirit of understanding these deep truths. But it's not the area of philosophy that interests me. I want to get to know God more and more. That's why I've entitled this series, Knowing the Father that we would have a personal and intimate knowledge of who he is and what he has done for us. That's why any time in the Bible we read one of God's names, we should be very, very attentive. Because when God reveals to us his name, he's revealing to us his nature. Not just in some abstract way that somebody could write a theological book and describe God in a theological, abstract and philosophical way. No, God reveals his name to us so that we can get to know him personally. It's like that in human relationships as well. If we don't know somebody's name, we don't really think we can know the person. And as soon as somebody introduces himself to us by their name, we have a way of relating to that person. But when it comes to knowing God's names, it's even more significant than that because God's names are not just labels. His name is the revelation of who he is and what he wants to do for you. In today's program, we're going to be looking at the name of God, the name that is used more often than any other name. He is Yahweh. He is the Jehovah God. And what is this all about? It means that God revealed himself to Moses through this name and his identity, but also he said, Moses, by my name, Yahweh, you are going to know who I am and what I am going to be for you. I am going to be for you what I will be. And not only will I be this for you now, but I will be this for you and for your people forever. And that's why this topic on knowing God's name is so exciting. And also in this series we speak about so many other different names of God, the root names of God, the basic names of God, the branch names of God, the trunk names of God, and even beyond that, the descriptions, the nuances of who God is. One name isn't enough to reveal everything that God is. 300 or more descriptions follow this line, but it all comes back to knowing God as Yahweh. Today, as you watch 
this program, I pray that you'd open your heart and your spirit to receive this revelation. God will be for you today, whatever you need him to be, whatever your need is. If you need him as savior, he will be there for you. If you need him as healer, he'll be there for you. If you need him as provider, he'll be there for you, for he is God our Father. Hello and welcome back to the Sword of the Spirit training session on knowing the Father. And uh, as I've been teaching you so far, I've been pointing you towards the knowledge of God, deep spiritual, experiential knowledge of God, not just to fill your head with facts about Him, but to know Him personally. And one of the ways in which God allows us to know Him is by the revelation of His name. It's rather like a handle by which we may lay hold of God uh, and get to know Him. And I've begun to sh show you that there are many, many different names of God, o over 300 different names of God in the Bible. But there are a number of names which are basic and fundamental names. I call them the root names. And the first name we looked at at the end of last session was Elohim. Now we're coming to look at another root name, and that's the name Yahweh. It's the common name of God, and uh, we can use it as God's first name, or His personal name. It's used over 6,800 times in the Old Testament, from Genesis 2 right the way through to Malachi chapter 4. In the older versions of the Bible, Yahweh is translated with capital letters such as Lord or God. And in most modern translations, it appears simply as Yahweh, to stress that this is God's personal name. Yahweh is in itself an ambiguous word connected with the Hebrew verb to be, haya. It means to be, or I am who I am, or I was who I was, I will be who I will be. And this is clearly hinted at in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, where it says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes, around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Yahweh, unlike Elohim, is in the singular, and it's the name that God used to reveal himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and in Exodus chapter 6 at the burning bush. Now, these verses show that God's most basic nature is to become whatever His people need in order to meet their need. I am that I am. What does that mean? I will be what I will be. I will be whatever you need me to be. And at that time, they needed a deliverer. They needed God to set them free from the bondage of, of Egypt and to deliver them and rescue them and take them into the new land, the land of God's promise. All this is clearly seen in the use of Jesus' I am sayings. In John 6, 35, I am the bread of life, and so forth. Right the way through, I am the door, I am the light of the world. All the way through John's gospel, I've listed the references there for you. We see Jesus declaring himself to be the one who has revealed Yahweh, the true and the living God. Frequently, God is called Yahweh Elohim, these two names join together. And wherever we find that, we find God here uh, in, in a full revelation, wrapping together His absolute power, His personal will, and His plurality, and His oneness, all wrapped up in one divine being, Yahweh Elohim. Now, as with Elohim, several aspects of God's nature are highlighted by joining different Hebrew words to Yahweh. For example, God is named as the Lord who Yahweh Yireh, the Lord who provides, the Lord who Yahweh Rapha heals, Yahweh Nisai, the Lord who is a banner or a battle ensign, Yahweh Makedeshchem, the God who sanctifies, Yahweh Shalom, the Lord who brings peace, Yahweh Sabaot, the Lord who possesses armies, Yahweh Rohi, the Lord who is a shepherd, my shepherd. Yahweh Tzitkenu, the Lord who is righteousness. Yahweh Shama, the Lord who is there. Now, it would be very good for us to have a look at Exodus chapter 6 because here we have the uh, 
this name unpacked for us. Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 to 6. In chapter 3, Moses says, Lord, I, I, got to, I got to know your name because when I go back there and say the God of our fathers has revealed himself to me, they're going to want to know what his name is. Now, they knew the name of God. What are they talking about? I want to know, we want to know his name. They weren't asking what label is God using nowadays to call himself. No, not what, not what label is on the bottle, but what's in the bottle. Not what name do you bring like a label, but what revelation of God do you bring? And, and, and Moses said, when I get back, I'm going to tell them that the God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has revealed himself to me, and I need to know what you're going to do. What is your revelation? What's your will for us? What are you going to be for us? What are you going to be? And in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 to 6, we have the name Yahweh unpacked for you. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. It's the word Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. Now, the words, I'm giving you, Moses, a new revelation. I'm about to do something new and show you something new about who I am. Verse 4, I've also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And now he's going to just unpack it. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. This is what I will be for you. This is what I will do. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. That's what Yahweh means. It means I will come down and rescue you and redeem you and deliver you and bring you out of bondage and be your God and faithfully lead you into all my goodness and all my promises. That's what the word Yahweh means. That's what the name means. And so we see how important it is to grasp the meaning of these names because they carry the very revelation of God himself. So the three trunk names, first of all, Elohim. Secondly, Yahweh. Now the third trunk name, that very basic name, uh, sorry, I'm talking about root names, beg your pardon. I'm in the root still, haven't come to the trunk yet. Three root names, Elohim, Yahweh, and the third one, Adonai. Okay, now the third one, Adonai, is not quite so common as the other two, but it's still very significant. It's used 350 times in the Old Testament. It's always translated as Lord. Adonai points to the unique authority and shows God's unique authority and shows the one who should be obeyed. It means Lord. So in Israel, slaves, wives, and subjects used Adonai to identify and address their masters. Adonai was a neutral name for God speaking about his lordship. Sometimes it's linked with Yahweh or Elohim. So we have Adonai Yahweh, almost 200 times, the Lord God. Or Adonai Elohim, about 15 places, translated as the Lord God. And in two, time, two places, Adonai Yahweh and Elohim appear together. Let's look at that. Amos 3, verse 13. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts. So for a special emphasis, God brings the three root names together. Adonai, Yahweh, Elohim. 2 Samuel 7, verse 8. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Here David is reveling in the promise that God has just made him, that he's going to build a house for him, and his name is going to endure forever as the prototypical king, as the forerunner of the great Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And David says, O oh Lord, you are God. We could paraphr paraphrase this as saying, O oh my ruler Yahweh, you are the all-powerful God. Now these three root names generally point to God's transcendent power. Elohim, his transcendent power. Yahweh, his imminent personal presence. And Adonai, his unique authority. 
So the Old Testament passages which name God as Elohim tend to focus on the beyond everything nature of God, the abstract, beyond everything, the cosmic dimensions of his character. The passages that speak of God as Yahweh tend to stress the imminence, the God with us aspects of his nature. God speaks to his people in person, who personally meets our needs, who is known as our God. And the passages which address God as Adonai focus on the personal relationship that the people enjoyed with the Lord, with their owner and with their spouse, with their king. So those are the three root names. Now, if we move further up the tree, we come to the tree trunk. And here we have four trunk names which, which grow out of these root names and depend upon them. We've seen the many scriptural names which are founded on Elohim and Yahweh, but most of those names only appear once or twice. But there are four of these combinations that appear with great frequency. And it's on the basis of the number of times they appear in the Bible that I've selected them as trunk names, which grow out from the root names. And these trunk names reveal for us fundamental aspects of God's nature and character. And they're combinations of the three root names. So we have Yahweh Sabaoth, the powerful God. This is used 200 times in the Bible, and it's translated usually as the Lord of hosts. And this indicates that God is the leader of a large and powerful army. It's a military name which demonstrates that God is a mighty, victorious, all-conquering God of battles. He fights battles. He defeats enemies. He establishes his kingdom. This is the name that King David enjoyed, it seems, very much. In 1 Samuel 17, 45, uh, he, he describes God as this. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David never forgot that. He became a mighty warrior king. And it's therefore very, very common in everything that David touches, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Psalms, and all the early prophets who ministered in this anointing when Israel and Judah were ruled by kings. And there's a whole range of scriptures which show you that the Lord is the Lord Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of military might, the God of the armies of heaven. But there are other names which express similar thoughts. Strength. He is described as the God of strength, the mighty one, the warrior, the war banner, the terrible and triumphant, the marching sword, the Lord of glory, the glory and power, valiant, retribution, deliverer. A friend of mine signs his letters always as, your battle axe for Jesus. And uh, if, you, if you met him, you knew he, would be a, he is a battle axe. I can think of many people who, who are like that because we take on this military kind of mentality. In fact, there can be no civilian mentality if you're serving Yahweh Sabaoth, because you're part of his army, and you experience his strength and his victory in your life. Now, the second trunk name is El Elyon, the protecting God, translated most frequently as the Most High. Uh, a friend of mine, Kent Maddox, has just written a book. Uh, he's coming from a drug addiction background. God set him free, delivered him, put him into ministry. Uh, and his book is called, No High Like the Most High. <laughs> oh, yes, he says, God is the protecting God. He set me free, and he's protected me from myself and brought me into the ministry. This reveals God's character as the strong protector who delivers us and protects us from all kinds of evil and harm, and it also suggests God's infinite height and his strength. This name is first used in Genesis 14, verse 18, in connection with, Mel Mel with Melchizedek, who is the priest of the Most High God. But it's used in many, many other contexts in the Old Testament, and uh, it shows us that God is the God who protects his people. 
So many other names of God are linked to this aspect of protection, and it's absolutely characteristic of who God is. And we see these other names, which are suggestive also of this name. Shield. The Lord is your shield. He's your support. He's your rock. He's your fortress. He's your savior, your refuge, your protector, your shelter, your citadel, your strong tower, your battlement, your sanctuary, your defender, your stronghold. So the Lord El Elohim is, uh, is the God Most High, your protector God. So he is also, number three, the third trunk name, El Kodesh, the perfect God. And it's used about 60 times in the Old Testament, and it's translated into English as the Holy One, or the Holy One of Israel. Now, God has revealed this holy, set-apart side to his nature in the, book of in the book of Leviticus particularly. I am the Lord who makes you holy. I am holy. And it's the basic name of God that shows he's set apart from his creation by his eternal, uncreated nature, by his moral perfection. El Kodesh suggests that God may not be approached by those who are morally flawed. And so this name appears most often in, in the book of Leviticus and Psalms and Isaiah and Ezekiel where God's holiness is stressed in a remarkable and a wonderful way. Let's have a look at one example. Uh, Isaiah 29 and verse 23. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in the midst, in his midst they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. Hosea 11 verse 9, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God, not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. So God here is saying, in my holiness you can, and you can respect what I say. I'm not going to be like other people to break my word. I set myself apart from everybody else. When I say, I am your God, I will stay with you, and I will keep you. So his holiness, when it's committed to us, as his covenant children, is a great comfort. It's not just that which causes us to fear because of his moral perfection, but it's that which sets him apart as being different from everybody else who will never fail you, never let us down. So we see this aspect of God's holiness and moral perfection in other names. Judge, sanctifier, the cloud, the consuming fire, the faithful, the jealous, the heavenly God, the arbiter, the, uh, the righteous one, king of glory, truth, illustrious and majestic, hidden, just. Oh, I'd like to have a, have a praise song with all those words in it, describing the perfections and the glories of our God and of our King, Yahweh Kodesh. Now, this shows us of his, his self-revelation as he is a holy and a faithful God. I've read it before as I've been teaching you Exodus 34, verse 6. Let's come back to it again. This verse is, I could describe it as God's amplified name because it's fundamental to both the Jewish and our Christian understanding of God and it's how God unpacks his name. Here he is, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth. And so, here we have this El Kodosh, this holy God. Now we have number four, the fourth trunk name, El Shaddai, the providing God. And it's used uh, quite a few times in the Old Testament, and in some of the older versions of the Bible, El Shaddai, is translated as the Almighty. But it's quite difficult to translate it like that, both by the context and also the, the use of the word. Now, it's very difficult to find out the original meaning of the word El Shaddai, or Shaddai. And in the teaching on faith, this series Living Faith, go into this in some detail. It's very hard to find out the derivation. Many people think it comes from the Assyrian word for mountain. And that justifies Almighty, this translation Almighty. Others, however, argue that it's derived from the Aramaic word to poor, and some people even point to the similarity of the root to the Hebrew word for breast, and describing him as the many-breasted God, or, and, and so forth. 
but that's a pagan concept of a female deity and very unlikely to have been the root meaning of the Hebrew Shaddai, just the similarity in the sound of the word. So we have to get it from the context, and it seems that the Old Testament translation into Greek, the Septuagint version, they translate, translate El Shaddai as the sufficient one, and that seems to be a very good translation because it makes sense in the context. In the book of Genesis, El Shaddai is almost always used as God's, as an example of God's provision, his extravagant covenant pr provision. He said to, to uh, uh, um, Abraham, he said, you, I am God Almighty, I'm El Shaddai, and I'm going to transform both you from Abraham into Abraham and your circumstances of childlessness into having children because I am the God who keeps my covenant. I am sufficient for your every need and I'm going to fulfill my covenant promises out of my sufficiency. And it's good for us to know that our El Shaddai, his name is Jesus. He is a sufficient one. Our sufficiency is in him. And it's because of what he's done for us, through us, and in us, and to us that we are saved. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves. It's of him through his anointing in our lives. And so we grasp that El Shaddai is the all-sufficient one. And it's the name by which the patriarchs commonly grasped God and understood that who he was who he claimed to be. Now, this providing side of God's nature is also seen in some other names. Genesis 22, 14, and in fact, all the references are there for you in the manual. I won't read them out. He is the provider. He is the lamp who gives light and illumination. He is your maker. He is the God of goodness. He is your cup provider. He is your counselor, the one who gives you wisdom. He is your light, your comforter, your fountain. And so in all of these wonderful trunk names, we see the glory of God and something specific about God's revelation to you and in your life. And in just the same way as the root names reveal God's presence and his person to you, so these trunk names sustain you in your relationship with him and bring you closer and closer into a knowledge of God.